and welcome along to the Property Academy podcast. I am your host, Ed McKnight. And I'm Andrew Nichols. And today on the show, we're answering another listener question, one that's come in actually after the webinar we just recorded last Tuesday. And there are two parts to this question that we'll go through. It comes from uh, long-time listener Paul Kay. Thanks for listening to the show, Paul, and for submitting this question. And it comes off the back of the last uh, or one of the previous shows we recorded. So we talked through three different situations or scenarios that would add heat to the property market. We talked about what would happen if mortgage terms uh, were, were lengthened what would happen if the servicing test rate came down and what would happen if the LVR restrictions changed and were relaxed. And then Paul said, well, how do, how would this actually impact the market? Walk me through it because uh, if, if more debt is in the market, if consumers or sorry, I should say home buyers or prospective property purchasers are able to take on more debt, that doesn't necessarily change the fundamental value of that asset, the asset being the property. So how does more debt change the price? You know, because it doesn't, because he's right that it doesn't change, I guess, the underlying value of the property. So we're going to discuss this today. And then we've also got some discussions around uh, being a first home buyer as well. Now, Andrew, before I read along, because I could read along for, for probably about 20 or 30 minutes about this, um, what, what was your kind of response when initially hearing this question? What, why would a change in people's ability to borrow and take on more debt change house prices? So the main reason that uh, finance has such a big part in the property market is because the control of lending based on whether or not you can actually get it and then whether or not you can borrow more money often dictates how much someone's willing to pay. So for example, when banks are more restrictive, so thinking back to the GFC, there was a lot less money available for people to buy houses and you, there were much more, much further restrictions put in place. Similarly, we've had uh, with the LVR restrictions and investors not being able to buy it, borrow as much as a percentage, same with first home buyers, people's deposit doesn't go as far anymore. So as a result, that can take a bit of heat out of the market because all of a sudden, even if someone was willing to pay 650 for their dream house, they can only pay 600 if that's what their maximum approval is. And um, I guess residential property is quite a lot different to commercial property in the sense that it's driven by emotion most of the time. So it's either a first-home buyer or, a, or, or, a, or an owner-occupier person upsizing or, or downsizing. Usually it's driven by people who are making an emotive decision, generally speaking. And so that will always be determined a little bit on what their purchasing power is. And so quite simply, if there's more money available, people tend to pay a bit more and with rates coming down, for example, well, it cost them the same uh, to borrow 700000 or 600000 three months ago, so why wouldn't you? I'd just jump in there as well and challenge the initial notion that, that properties have a fundamental value at all uh, in terms of what something is actually worth because property, because it's about, uh, I believe, 76% made up of owner-occupiers in terms of residential property and only about 24% made up of of uh, landlords or property investors, um, the majority of the market is driven by emotion and just what people are willing to pay. And so I would I would first of all state that there's probably no fundamental value of a property, which is different potentially from the likes of a share or commercial property, which is much more yield driven. And you can see, uh, you can boil down a company's assets and if you were to liquidate them, you'd be able to figure out what a company was actually worth. And you could look at its revenues and decide, well, based on, on uh, how long I would be willing to wait in order to be get, able to get a return from a, a dividend or revenues, you know, this is what a share is, is worth. We don't necessarily have that same those same metrics uh, in, in residential property because it, it doesn't work the same way. Um, it, they don't necessarily have a fundamental value because it's driven by emotion. Now, a lot of people would say the share market's driven by emotion as well and uh, uh, shares don't necessarily have a fundamental value either and that's why they, they uh, change so much and vary so much in terms of the price of those shares. Um, so I'd first of all challenge challenge that part. Um, but I also just want to walk through two different scenarios of what would happen if lending was was more available. The first thing is we would have 
uh, lower barriers to entry into the market. So let's talk about the LVR restriction example, which is where investors who have uh, not currently under the current rules don't have enough usable equity to be able to leverage their existing properties to go buy another property. If the rules change, they're now able to do that. So the barriers to entry to go and buy more properties comes down. Same with the lowering of the uh, the lowering of the servicing test rate. So if you take that from 7% down to 5%, then more first home buyers are able to get into the market. And simply, if you have more people competing for the same number of houses, the price is going to go up because people will start to bid those prices up. Similarly, if we saw especially first and second home buyers, if those servicing test rates decrease, then they would be able to borrow more and that allows them to go and buy more expensive properties that I can, I'm basically trying to say they'd go and buy nicer properties as well. So they would increase the amount that they're willing to to bid and increase the amount they're willing to spend. That gives brings more competition brings more competition into that kind of tier of properties, again, starting to heat up the market. So if any of these financial barriers change and and allow more people to become property buyers, then naturally they're going to start to bid prices up. And I think we saw this when interest rates came down. Uh, before 2008, they were up around 8 10% in places. Now that they've come down, structurally the financial market has changed and that's led to a property boom and prices have uh, increased severely over the last 10 years. And that's in part not due to incomes rising, although they have risen, it's actually that people can borrow more and can go out and compete and bid that extra five grand. And then at the next property auction, somebody's able to bid the extra five grand because they're willing to do it. And all of a sudden, people just want to get into the property market. And so it, 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 the, the difference between what somebody somebody earns and what somebody uh, is willing to pay, that's why it has become so different because we've been able to take on more lending, even though because interest rates have decreased, essentially the payments have, are the same and, and house prices are, are still affordable in terms of what somebody is paying because interest rates have decreased. And I just want to tell a, a little story. When I was a young, impressionable kid sitting down in <laughs> South Taranaki watching the television, we used to watch watch Minor 10 Dream Home. Do you remember that show, was Andrew? It a, was it a, yeah, was it in black and white for you? No, no. Black and I suppose it was probably. Oh, no, Andrew, you, for, you forget that you're about 10 years older than me. <laughs> 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 no, so we would watch Minor 10 Dream Home. Great show that was as well. And... Uh, and, and I would the block before the block. Wasn't it? Oh, it was. It was much before the block, and actually before Minor Team Dream Home, there was uh, Minor Team Changing Rooms. That was a great show as well. Uh, look at us reminiscing about the nineties and early two thousands. And uh, what what has stuck with me since I was a kid watching Minor Team Dream Home. I would remember those people that worked so hard in order to be able to get that, build this property or to to make over this property. I forget exactly how, how the show worked. And then they would go to the bank. And I think during this show, they actually went to Kiwi Bank and they would see how much they could borrow. And they would always look at it on a 30 year and they'd say, well, what, what's the maximum we can get? Because we really want this house. We love this house. And they would, you know, almost without fail, the TV producers probably planned this, but they would bid the price up to the maximum and then they'd get really emotional and they'd wait and yes, they've got the property, they've got it. Now, they weren't thinking about the fundamental value of that property. They weren't sitting there thinking, God, I wonder what this property is actually worth. It's only worth what somebody's willing to pay for it. And that that kind of uh, uh, TV show solidifies in my mind and it's kind of etched in my mind that people, uh, when they're going to live in a property themselves and they envision their kids uh, uh, living there and growing up there and having great memories there, it kind of people don't consider what what's the fundamental value of a property and there kind of isn't one in many ways because what is the value of the house? In some ways, I would just say, well, it's whatever the replacement cost is minus some depreciation. Uh, you know, and in that, that case, that's, that's because that's because you just think about the numbers and you you, you consider what the books call a psychopath then, Ed. But uh, the emotional <laughs> uh, part of things makes people spend so much more because they can see their kids growing up there, they can see them going to the local schools, and and they're wanting to pay no matter what a, what a, whatever amount they can to to make that dream a reality. 
Yes, yes, yes. And I wasn't actually actually just you know suggesting that we should just go around valuing things on <laughs> on what the replacement cost is. Um, you know, but essentially that's that is. Um, if you're going to look at a fundamental value, that would be what it is, whatever the replacement cost is. And you might look at the land and and figure out what somebody's willing to pay for that. But similarly then, in terms of the actual land as well, that is a, that is based on emotional factors and emotive factors. Um, you know, why is it that Fendleton is a very expensive area? You get Addington, we're talking in Christchurch suburbs now. Yeah, Addington, which is just on the other side of Hagley Park, uh, it, it, same, same distance to town, is is less than, less than half the price in terms of median suburbs values um, you know fundamentally they're the same distance from town uh, had Fendleton and those sort of nice properties been built on the other side of town I'm sure Addington would be just as expensive the land it really fundamentally isn't isn't worth any different it really should be the same yeah. but it's the the neighborhood the sort of people that live there the sort of houses that surround you the prestige of the area all of these other factors that people um, excuse the pun buy into, uh, and that bids up the price. So, uh, by by having by lowering the barriers to entry, and if everybody had more finance, then that would naturally bid the prop the price of many properties up because more people are able to get into the property market. Uh, more people in the market means that they will naturally bid properties up, uh, prices up because they're competing for the same number of houses. Uh, now you might see some more developers building some properties in order to respond to that demand, and that would be expected. But we would expect uh, a. a a, quite a significant lift in property prices if if some of these scenarios played out. And I realise that in order for this this show to actually kind of make sense, you probably have to listen to a couple of episodes back uh, just to the, that other show where we discussed the the three different scenarios that we, we anticipated would make the property market go berserk. And maybe this one three times at half the speed. <laughs> uh, I wish we could say that we'd had a few drinks, but do you know what? I think what it is, Andrew, is that we've just come off. Um, uh, th- this week has been intensive in terms of the number of webinars that we've actually done. Webinar? I think I think I've done four different live sessions or video sessions with different organisations this week, and they've all been very, very data heavy. And people have either said yes, we're following it, and, and not really meant it, or I've just started speaking a lot faster. <laughs> Anyway, let's wrap it up there, but please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. It really does help us get the message out to more people. And hey, if you're interested in how coronavirus and this coronavirus-induced shutdown is going to impact the rental market and how an increase in the number of Airbnbs coming on to residential property is going to affect the rental market, then come along to our live webinar that's happening this Tuesday at 7 p.m. Now, I'm going to drop the link to that in the show notes, uh, but so you can just tap or swipe over that cover art and it'll take you right there or just go to our website opuspartners.co.nz you can register for that and it's going to be very data heavy and it's going to be a lot a lot of fun so I can't wait to see you there Thanks for listening to the Property Academy podcast I'm your host Ed McKnight and we're going to be back again And we're going to be back again tomorrow with even more daily strategies, tactics and insights to help you get the most out of the New Zealand property market. Until next time.